So a lot of people don't realize you don't have to buy just one Bitcoin. Like literally. You can I, buy a fraction yeah. of Bitcoin every yeah, yeah. You can buy a Gemini and buy five dollars worth of Bitcoin <laughs> a fraction, but a lot of people say, oh, it's thirty-five thousand, I'll never afford it. It's like you can buy a very, very small piece. And a fun fact, there's forty-six million millionaires on the planet. It's only twenty-one million bitcoins, so they won't own uh, a Bitcoin. So if you own a Bitcoin today, you will be a millionaire in the future, for sure. Uh, congratulations. You guys are really buying favor with the audience, don't know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know how to win, it up, win them over. And, and, and so, looking forward, what are you most excited about around Bitcoin? Is it some of the layer two stuff? Is it kind of more people coming in and buying it? Just what gets you guys excited about the future of Bitcoin? So, one other thing is, I think I looked at, there's 32 companies that have Bitcoin on its back. There's, there, uh, so there's 40, 000, about 40, 50,000 publicly traded companies globally on global exchange. Okay. okay. 32 of them have Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Bitcoin during the pandemic, as soon as, when the markets melted for about that week and then people kind of got above water, people saw what was happening with the US dollar. They, they can do simple math at the Fed's balance sheet. They see it ballooning, they see the stimulus, and they know what's been happening even up to the pandemic. We've been on the turbo button, printing, 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 debt piling up. We gotta smash the turbo button to get through the pandemic or the, the lockdown. So the gold 2.0 story really resonated. The hedge against inflation, Bitcoin is the world's best hedge against inflation. It's the hardest, soundest money. It's better, it's harder than gold. And so all of those folks that would have been calling Bitcoin a fraud, skeptical, oh, I'm not really into technology, I don't get it. They saw what was happening with fiat regimes, the US dollar, it's the ultimate shit coin, like yeah. the euro, every single bit. Bitcoin's yeah, biggest that. booster is the Fed. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to show your shirt? Yep. Uh, let's <laughs> let's rage against the machine. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we, we, we Bitcoin's been having trillion dollar advertisements. Why Bitcoin can be used by everyone, but. You know, it, it just, um, like, we don't need the financial institutions that we have today. We have one that is thriving, that is sound, that is owned by the community, that is driven by the community, that has this incredible and amazing consensus that always manages to do the right thing over time. It's noble, and it's, it's so rare and so unique. So anything that we can do to Build it, it's protected. Um, we're down. We're down to do. You you recently personally uh, launched a new fund uh, with Jay Z, where you guys dedicated 500 Bitcoin to help. Will it harm my future career prospects in government? No. Let markets establish where value is. Two-way markets transparent, liquid, regulated markets. And so when we want, with, with green-lighted the launch of Bitcoin futures at the CFTC, it was the belief that markets were the best way to establish the value proposition of Bitcoin. I think with, with that starting point, what I worry about is less of a market, a belief in markets, free markets, but more a, a, a return to sort of a political calculus. Political calculus as to, um, you know, should, should this, what you're building here, should that be allowed to continue to, to, to develop uh, and to, or to what extent should, should regulation and eventually political power fold it in? And I think that the ground is shifting right now 
the political forces are dropping back and recalculating. And I think that it's really a comfort for this industry to recognize that the past is not necessarily a guarantee of the future. I think the industry needs to recognize that there is political risk ahead and it needs to up its game so that if change and when change comes, that this industry is part of influencing that change and not sitting back and allowing it to happen in a way that's not necessarily market intelligent and understanding of the industry. Right, right, and I think, yeah, round of applause for that. Um, I mean, this, this reminds me of, of, of uh, uh, Ray Dalio, we probably saw the, you all probably saw the news about Ray Dalio last week, came out and announced that he owns Bitcoin, he preferred Bitcoin or a bond. Uh, but in that interview that he gave, he was he was mentioning that he views Bitcoin, the greatest risk to Bitcoin is really its success, right? It's, it's just become this thing that is so unstoppable, has so much momentum, and that governments are looking at this and they, 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 they're like, well, we need to do something because we can't control it, we can't, or, or um, you know, I mean, Brian, do you want to take this question? Like, what do you see as kind of like the biggest risk? I guess both both kind of like the macro of maybe Bitcoin generally, but also to your specific sort of accomplishments at the OCC. Yeah, well, look, the, the idea that we're gonna be a victim of our own success, I think has two sides to it. So first of all, you know, there's an old line in Washington which says that you know the power of a man based on the power of his enemies. So when the chairman of the Fed starts targeting you, you know you're doing something right, right? I mean, <laughs> seriously. So to, to me, what I've always said is, there's an Uber effect out there, which is once you grow to a certain scale, you can't be stopped. And so the important thing is to get to scale fast enough. And you know, we've had a great year in this field. You know, Bitcoin went from something that nobody had ever heard of except cypherpunks five years ago to something that smart money was dabbling in as an investment asset three years ago to something that is now a core platform for financial services today. I would argue we've had our Uber moment. It's too late, okay? Once the powerful people are on the other side, you've won. So, so turning, I mean, th this year, the last three, four months, I
We just become sponsors. And, you know, you want to gain status quo, you, you want to gain some establishment, and, and you build your own uh, legacy. Why did you choose not to, to take on sponsors? Well, me myself, it's, it's just like the cryptocurrency world. Somebody had to start this. Somebody had to be the first. So I wanted to be the first to go out there in, in sports without a certain name brand on my back and still be able to make over a billion dollars. And I'll take to do it. Because I feel like with different brands, the people own me. And I, I want to be independent. I want to be able to do the things that I want to do. I don't want nobody to own me. I want to be able to call my own shots. So just being my own boss and able to wake up and feel good every day. I'm happy with my career. And of course, Sunday we got another big day. But I, I'm just happy with how my career went. And the best thing that I did, I became my own boss where I could write my own checks. Exactly, I love it. It's a, you know, it's a public grind bit for be your own bank. The same thing, be your own boss, right? You have no third party middleman that tells you what to do, how to do it. And I think that's why Bitcoin's bought it to where it is today is it's this, this feeling of, of being liberated. And I think that's kind of what you felt with these sponsors. So very, uh, very uh, Okay, a few, a few questions. So, okay, so the Bitcoin world, there's a lot of ups and downs. I've been here for a long time, 2013, 2017 all up and down. I think a few weeks ago, everyone in this room was going panicking in front of the screen of it. You always talk about mental toughness. So I'd love for you some tips on mental toughness or you know, how, to, how to stick through it. It's 50 and 0, it's, you know, that's a lot of I want the people to believe in themselves. And everybody in the crypto world is competing with one another. Whereas, I feel like everybody Choose what they should be able to choose what they want to choose and go with who they want to go with. I, th I don't think I think everybody should work together. And what I always did was I believed in myself. Before anybody else believed in me, I believed in myself. And I believe that it's going to be, you know, a, another cryptocurrency that's going to be just as large as Bitcoin someday. And, and Read the room. Everybody's entitled to make. Everybody, everybody is entitled to their own opinion. I, I, I got to where I, I got to where I got to. I, I don't not I don't not anyone, but I got to where I got to without no cryptocurrency. So without no cryptocurrency, I, I was able to make over a billion dollars, and to this day. I'm still living a great life. So with or without any cryptocurrency, Floyd Mayweather is going to be OK. <laughs> Um, there's also a lot of different brands coming into the space. 
space. And so you're a Jersey fan right now, it's part of your legacy. What does mean um, what is legacy mean to you? Well, not too long ago. Well, I think it's, like, it's been about a week. My NFT drop and it's number one. And I want the people that has that have supported me throughout the years, all around the world, to be a part of my legacy, to own a piece of my legacy. Because I didn't get to where I, I got to without the fans. Uh, so you got a fight coming up? Let's talk about the fight. Yes. Because, so anything you'll like to say about the upcoming fight actually? I just want everybody to tune in. I tell people that I retired from the sport of boxing, but I did retire from entertaining, and I did retire from making money. So Sunday, I will go out, have fun. Sunday, I will go out, have fun, and do what I do. And be be for the main one. I'm 50 and 0 for a reason. 50 and 0. Thank you. are sort of meshing into the banking world. There's this idea of Bitcoin sort of replacing traditional finance. Is that good or bad? I, I, I see both sides. Um, I do. I think yeah. I, I think what will be really interesting is I, I think it's a matter of years before we start seeing big financial institutions merging into the crypto space and it becoming one. And that's a good thing if you are looking for um, mass adoption and more embracing of the industry. It will, like you're saying, sort of lead to this increased surveillance, and that's something we all need to work on. I think everyone on this panel works to discuss this with regulators, because for some reason, regulators, when they hear crypto and privacy, they think crime. And those things should not, I mean, there are legitimate reasons why people want financial privacy that have nothing to do with tax evasion, money laundering, or illicit, you know, terrorist financing. everybody. Awesome. I want to be the uh, official photographer. Okay, you you're, you're now you're the official yeah. photographer. <laughs> hey oh, man, good deal. Awesome. I love his stuff. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to keep walking yeah. around, but yeah. catch up with me in a little bit. I'll be walking around. Okay. I'd like to get the... I do have one. Hold yeah, on a second. Yeah. 
sure. All right here. I got some awesome photos of Mayweather yesterday. Did and, you? Like, the whole team back. Hey, get with me on that because I'll put it up on Twitter yeah. and and, and, and uh, I tagged get you. you. I tagged you in all the stuff yesterday. Okay. Yeah. Find me. I'll be around here. Okay. You can't cool. Listen. Yeah. Good to see you. <laughs> you too, man. See, you meet all kinds of uh, interesting people around here. You know, patience is key. Revolutions don't happen overnight. And so let's just talk about the, the wealth channels of America, right? The bulk of the wealth in America and in the world is by, held by 50 to 80 year olds. 50 year olds manage their wealth through financial advisors, right? You call your stockbroker, your FA, they tell you what to do. That's the way it works. It's not gonna change overnight, right? Uh, we, we did a partnership with Morgan Stanley uh, to sell a Bitcoin fund. Pretty simple, straight vanilla Bitcoin fund. Uh, what was interesting about that is Morgan Stanley put, I think, 4,000 already of their 12,000 FAs through a Bitcoin course. In order to sell it, they had to take a course so they understood it. I've done, I don't know, nine teach-ins. Uh, I'm begging for less. Uh, with, with their different sales forces. Uh, our team continues to work with them. And you know, we have a competitor, New York Dig, that's also doing it. And so you're getting all kinds of education. And so think about what just happened. We now have 4,000 new Bitcoin salesmen. They're out there telling the same story that I was telling five years ago. Uh, I used to feel like it was like me and Dan Moorhead are the only institutional guys when we started. And, and now there's an army of them. Um, Goldman Sachs is coming down the pipeline with the same thing. JP Morgan is coming down the pipeline with the same thing. PNC Bank, you name it, every financial institution is now going to at least offer a Bitcoin product in their wealth management division. The faster ones are saying, oh, we need to start trading it as well. So we need the infrastructure to actually transact in it. And so these big institutions are going on the same journey uh, in crypto that most of us went down. And start with Bitcoin, we're gonna understand it, we're gonna look at the rest of the ecosystem, does it work or not? Does it work for us? Uh, and they're going to slowly build their risk tolerance up. But what's important is how do you get people in the tent? We're going to literally have 25,000 new salesmen with huge amounts of wealth in their account base telling their customers that you should at least put 2 to 4% of your net worth in crypto. IndyCar Rookie of the Year, youngest to qualify in the front row at third. I was standing with fucking Saquon Barkley for the national anthem next to the PNC Bank car and had Russell O'Kong asking him how much Bitcoin they want to take that fiat cuckbuck stuff off their car. <laughs> and that's because this guy qualified. How many laps did he lead? In the beginning of that race, we all couldn't believe seeing a Bitcoin logo on national television. Uh, and he finished eighth. It was a a tough last pit. There's nothing you could do about it. That's how the sport is played, but let's give it up for Rock Arenas, man. Congratulations, buddy. And then this one, I, I may get a little emotional, this one. Ed is a, a legend of his sport. Um, Ed's the only owner driver uh, in the IndyCar series. Um, allowing me to be a part of this, Ed, and what you've done for Bitcoin. 
it's 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 unbelievable. You're so humble. You're so generous, and um, you're supporting what I believe is the most important project we got going for humanity, man. And uh, look at this crowd. Um, you're a rock star, man. You're a rock star. Um, and Ed is not. Ed, Ed's a Bitcoin maximalist. He's a hodler last resort. He's got the laser eyes on Twitter. Um, and he's the one that called this shot. Uh, I didn't call Ed, Ed called me. 